Psalm 55, verses 12 through 19. Isaiah 59, verses 19 through 21. And 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. From the 55th number of the Psalms, the 12th through the 19th verses, we shall find these words. And since we're standing, let's all stand. As the Bible says, they were with one accord. If you have your Bibles, it would be good medicine for you to read these verses together in unison. Psalm 55, verses 12 through 19. For it was not an enemy that reproached me. Then I could have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me. Then I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou, a man, mine equal, my guide and mine acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked unto the house of God in company. Let death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell for wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. As for me, I will call upon God and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. He hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me, for there were many with me. God shall hear and afflict them, even he that abideth of old, because they have no changes, because they fear not God. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 19 through 21. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him and the redeemer shall come to Zion. And unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I would like to enter into the record verses 42 through 58, but I heard that even in the church uh, there is a spirit of a lack of attention. And that's why we give some of our children Ritalin because of attention definite disorder. So I'm not going to read all of that, but I will read verses 57 and 58. Let's read that together. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the law. Let us say thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. And so we want to reason together this morning from this subject, a steadfast ministry for critical times. Will you repeat that after me? A steadfast ministry for critical times. Thanks be to God for these 
intimate words that God speaks from his heart to our heart. For it is God who teaches us that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. For the tongue makes withdrawals on what has been deposited into the heart. For no one speaks off the top of their head or the tip of their tongue. People speak from what's inside their hearts. Now some people might want you to think that that came off the tip of their tongue or the top of their head or that it was a Freudian misstatement. But we know better than that. We know that nobody says what's on the tip of your tongue because the Bible is right. And the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So if it's in your heart, if you've been thinking it and saying it in private, if you've been discussing it out of the spotlight where you thought that you wouldn't be heard or noticed, and then all of a sudden when you got back into public interaction, a nerve was struck in your psyche and you didn't know that you were going to react in the same way that you've been reacting privately. And what you've been saying and thinking and discussing privately comes out publicly. And then after you put your foot halfway down your throat, you want to say, I didn't mean that. Yes, you did mean it. Because you've been thinking it and saying it all the time. And that is why we must interpret anthropomorphic statements about God. Because we recognize the inability of the limited human mind to embrace the eternity of God's revelation. And because the finite cannot explain or understand the infinite, then we need the assistance of the Holy Spirit to engage God who is infinitely beyond our level of comprehension. The Bible says his ways are past our finding out. So when we use the anthropomorphic illustration, anthropomorphism is a tendency to assign to divinity human characteristics. It is an effort to take God out of his divine and spiritual context and to put him in a little bitty human or carnal box. It is an effort to remake and to remold God after our image. For God is a spirit. And that is to say, God technically doesn't have fingers, thumbs, arms, hands, feet. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And it doesn't matter how much you use your hand or your mouth or your feet. If worship is not in your spirit, then you are engaging in mechanical activities. But when worship is in your spirit, that's when the spirit of the living God will fall fresh upon you in such a way that he breaks you and melts you and molds you so that he can fill you and use you. 
Nobody can worship God unless the Spirit falls upon them and breaks your pride, your arrogance, your carnality. And when God breaks you, that's when worship comes forth. God is near to them of a broken heart and a crushed spirit. You got to understand what the anointing means. The anointing is not pretty. The anointing is ugly and messy and inconvenience. You better know what you're talking about when you say, anoint me, Lord, because you can't get an anointing unless God smashes the olive, breaks it. And when he smashes it, that's when the oil flows. So you ain't going to never be anointed as long as you got your legs crossed and your arm folded and you all up into yourself and your pride because you in it for form and fashion. Worship only happens when God gets you out of your comfort zone. God gets you out of your place and convenience and then messes you up. Remember, the anointing is messy. Psalm 133 says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers and sisters to live together as one. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even the high priest Aaron's beard, even to the skirts of his garments, which means that when God anointed him, God messed up his hair, messed up his eyes, messed up his beard, got his garments greasy because the anointing will shake you up. <laughs> Worship then means that God has to bring you into a broken place. He has to bring you into a place where he can pierce your psyche, where he can shake up what you think you know about God because just about time you think you know him, that's when you find out you really need a new Holy Ghost introduction. <laughs> The disciples thought they knew Jesus because they had seen him open blinded eyes and cast out demons and raise the dead. But when Jesus went to sleep in that boat in the midst of a tempest where the boat was being rocked as though it was a toy and the disciples looked death in the face. They just knew they were getting ready to die. And then they had the nerve to say to Jesus, you don't even care that we're getting ready to perish out here in the middle of this storm. Jesus woke up, didn't talk to them, didn't talk about the weather. He talked to the weather and said, peace, be still. And then the disciples backed off from him and said, we thought we knew him. What manner of man is this? We thought we knew him because we saw him feed the hungry. We saw him cleanse lepers. We saw him cast out demons. We didn't think he could make a storm. Sit down and behave yourself. What manner of man is this? You can't get to know God until God draws you into a place where he rearranges your priorities. God brings you into a place where you let go and let God. That is why when God brings us to the point of worship, we have to allow the yes, Lord, to flow from within our spirit. That is what we see happening in these kindred passages of Scripture inspired by the Holy Ghost. We notice that God in Isaiah 59 gives us grace to understand the move of the Spirit spirit in rearranging the punctuation because punctuation is significant. The punctuation says is there no bomb in Gilead? Question mark. Is there no physician there? Question mark. 
But when the Holy Spirit affirms his presence and power, he gives you authority to change the punctuation so you take what was doubt, fear, and uncertainty into affirmation and faith. And then you take the hammer of the word of God and beat that crooked question mark and straighten it into an exclamation point. You used to say, is there no bomb in Gilead? But because you have authority to address the punctuation in life, you say there is a bomb in Gilead. There is a physician there because he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of his peace is upon him and with his stripes we are healed. Why don't you change the punctuation and say we're healed. Come on and give God some praise for healing. In Isaiah 59 we find it necessary to address the punctuation because the word of God is inspired. But we're the ones who came back and added some things. We added chapters. We added verses. We added question marks. We added commas, periods, semicolons, colons. Well, if you were to let the Spirit speak for himself, he would add his own punctuation. Look how you messed up when you added the punctuation. The word says, when the enemy shall come in, that's where the comma goes. After, when the enemy shall come in. Like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. You're the one that limits God, anthropomorphizes God, puts God in a little caramel weak box by putting the comma after flood. It's not the enemy's flood, it's God's flood. When the enemy comes in, that's all he can do is come in. But God floods him out. God overthrows him, overpowers him. God lifts up a standard Again, I wish I had some real Bible readers up in here today. Notice that he does not say if the enemy comes in. He says when the enemy comes in. And so since the enemy is going to come in anyhow, you've got to learn how to remain steadfast when your enemy shows up. You got to learn how to keep on shouting when your enemy shows up. You got to learn how to magnify God and make him bigger than your problem. Don't just tell God about your problem. Tell your problem about your God. Change the punctuation. Say yes. Not if the enemy, but when. So when the enemy comes in, don't act sadiddy and stuck up. Don't act like you shocked because he told you you were going to have to go through, not around, through the valley of the shadow of death without fearing any evil. And so when you get ready to go in there, don't wait till you get in there. On your way in, holler, yay! Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because God is not only with me, God is in me. God is for me. God is all around me. God is all over me. And if God be for us, who can be against I think you ought to put some praise right there. Not if, but when the enemy comes in. Don't get antisocial and, and don't say, good morning, enemy. <laughs> 
how you doing, enemy? God bless you, enemy. In fact, I thank God for you, enemy, because I'm going to eat today, because God's not going to feed me till the enemy go to acting a fool, and in the presence of my enemies, he puts his apron on and spreads a table before me in the presence of my enemy. You better watch out. I'll shout all over you. I'll magnify God. I'll let my cup run over, and when I do that, I'm going to get a fresh anointing. He anoints my head with all. My cup runs over because the enemy can't stop me from being blessed. Why don't you look at somebody and tell them, your enemy can't stop you from being blessed. Why don't you give God some praise for your enemy? When the enemy comes in comma like a flood the spirit capital s-p-i-r-i-t of the lord shall lift up a standard against him and the redeemer shall come to zion and unto them that turn from transgression unto the lord god has the ability to open up floodgates and run your enemy out of your face. Come on, help me give God some praise. But the fact of the matter is, the saying has relevance with friends like these who even needs enemies. For Psalm 55 says, it was not an enemy that reproached me. <laughs> because the fact of the matter is, this word betrayal is never used about enemies. Because your enemy cannot betray you. The only person that can betray you is somebody you trust. The only person that can betray you is somebody you love. The only person that can betray you is somebody you put your confidence in. Somebody you shared your heart with. You don't do that with enemies. You may not be able to say man to that. Just say hmm. This is a messianic psalm, which means it is written for and about the ministry of the Messiah. And so in messianic context, the words of Jesus are projected 1,000 years before his actual birth. You need to know what God has invested in this moment. Psalm 55 was written 1,000 years before Christ. This is 2,022 years after Christ. God has invested 3,022 years in getting this word into your spirit. Isaiah was written 700 years before Christ. That means you got 2,722 years invested in that manifestation. 1 Corinthians is written in the first century. 2,022 years in that. Look at how much God has invested in getting this spirit special delivery express mail package in your spiritual mailbox. Jesus as a human had to put his confidence in somebody. He had to call somebody to ministry. He had to engage somebody in the work of the kingdom and that meant Jesus had to become vulnerable. Whenever you love somebody you become vulnerable. You can't hug somebody without becoming vulnerable. You can't get intimate with people. You can't share fellowship without becoming vulnerable. Jesus could not be betrayed as long as he minded his business and stayed up there at the right hand of the throne of God. But I can't mind my business when you are my business. I got to leave God's throne and save you because souls are my business. All souls are mine. The soul that sin it, it shall die. I love you enough to save you from yourself. I love you enough to save you from self-destruction. I love you enough. 
to save you from an evil world. Jesus had to trust somebody. I need to be betrayed in order to fulfill scripture. I need to be denied in order to get to the cross. I need somebody on the inside who will let me down. Judas didn't betray Jesus with a note of paper. You can't get to Jesus and I just give you a piece of paper and a description of what he looks like. No, no. I got to get intimate with Jesus. I got to put my arms around him. I got to kiss Jesus. The man that I kiss you see, that demonstrates that Jesus was Eastern and not Western. You may not be able to say amen. They just say, hmm. Jesus was not from the kind of civilization you are from. If a man says, I wear the pants in my house, well, let me help you deal with your insecure sense of masculinity. Because Jesus was a man, but never wore a pair of pants. Never wore a three-piece suit, starch collars, silk ties, alligator shoes. And still could outdress you because he dresses in glory, honor, majesty, dominion, and power. You understand, Jesus recognized that, that in the place of betrayal, that's where God manifests his purpose and calling upon my life. That is the place where God is calling me into and through and out of. And that is why when this messianic psalm is written, it's written about people we trust, people we believe in, who then take advantage of that trust because of jealousy, envy, strife, a hatred of the anointing and favor of God. Some people want to get close enough to you to stab you in your heart. They want to get close enough to you to drag you down. They want to get close enough to you to destroy you. And that is why the psalmist not only wrote it, but he sang it. It was not an enemy that betrayed me. If that were the case, I could have dealt with it. I could have prayed through it, but the person I trusted, the one I shouted with, the one I worshiped with, the one I preached with, the one that I had trust and confidence in our friendship, that's the one that let me down. That's when you got to be steadfast. Don't you understand him saying, we took sweet counsel together. We walked unto the house of God in company. But he says in verse 16, as for me, I will call upon God and the Lord will save me. Evening, morning, noon, will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. He has delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me for many were with me. God shall hear and afflict them and he that abideth of all. And then he threw this word in there called Selah. Selah is not something that you read. Selah is something that you do. He wasn't even at the end of the verse. He was right in the middle of the action. He was right in the center of the drama. He thought he could at least finish the verse, but all of a sudden his cup started running over and he had to stop in the middle of a sentence and just give God some crazy praise. Selah means hit the pause button and magnify God. Sometimes you got to praise him when you're upset. Praise him when tears in your eye. Praise him when you hurt. Praise him when you're wounded. Praise him when you've been let down. Come on, help me give God some glory here today.
Yes, the writer wants us to understand how this happened. He said in verse 20, he had put forth his hands against such as be at peace with him, which means I was hated without cause. I had not broken our trust. But the thing that happened, the words of his mouth were smoother than butter. But war, betrayal was in his heart. His words were softer than all. Beware of smooth talkers. Hello? Beware folk that always want to get all up in your business, want to get wrapped all up into your secrets. They want to know all about your family, want to get into places where they have no business. The old folk were right. It takes me six months to mind my business and the next six months to leave your business alone. Stay out of other folks' business. I dare you to shout. Run down the aisle on that. Yes, brothers and sisters, it's all right to work together. It's all right to engage in ministry. But even Aretha Franklin had a word that she spelled out. So you could look it up in the dictionary. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Some people don't have the capacity of agape love, but at least you ought to have some respect. Some folk don't know how to treat you like a brother or sister, but at least you ought to have respect. Some people don't know how to worship God, but at least you ought to respect God's house. Hello? Yes, brothers and sisters, critical times call for steadfast ministry. The standard of steadfastness is Jesus Christ. For Jesus had to remain steadfast when all around him was giving way. He had to remain steadfast even when those he had called, anointed, trusted, turned and ran away from him. Remember the song says my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Don't build your faith on unpredictable people. Don't build your religion on those who don't have your best interest at heart. If you're going to build, stop building on the sand. Learn how to build on a rock. Jesus, who is the master builder, said, Upon this rock I will build my church. He taught us in Matthew chapter 7 when people came to him and said, You don't preach like other folk, you don't teach like scribes and Pharisees. You don't have a ministry that tickles people's fancy and entertains them. Well, Jesus said, let me put it to you like this. The weather forecast is the same. Let me hear somebody say, the weather forecast is the same. Whatever you build, you're going to get the same weather. Whether you build your house on a sand or on the rock. If you build on the sand, here come the weather forecast. The flood shall rise. The wind will blow. The breakers shall dash. Trouble will come. But you don't have to worry about that. If you built your house on a solid rock, 
In fact, you might even miss the forecast for today because you know my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That means sing in the rain, shout in the rain, preach in the rain, worship in the rain, be faithful in a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. But if you built your house on the sand, you better be watching the clouds because the flood will come to your sand castle. The water will come against your sand castle. The wind will beat against the walls of your sand castle. And if you have a sandy relationship, then great will be the fall of your house. But whatever it takes, find the rock. However much it costs, find the rock. Even with tears in your eyes, find the rock. For the psalmist said, I go to the rock that is higher than I. God is a rock in a weary land. Storm, keep on coming. Rain, keeps on coming. Trouble, keeps on coming. One storm is called COVID. Another storm is called Omicron. Another storm, BA2. Another storm, BA5. Storms keep coming. Oh, Lord. Wind keeps blowing. Trouble keeps coming against me. But in the time of trouble, he'll hide me in his pavilion. Thank you, Lord, for hiding me. Oh, hide me till thy wrath is passed over. Hide me in the midst of calamity. Hide me, be a shelter over my head. Be a fence all around me so evil cannot harm me. Thank you, Lord. Somebody help me tell him thank you. Thank you for hiding me. Oh, oh Lord, I need a hiding place. I need a rock. I need a shelter. I need a God who promised never to leave me. I need a God who walks with me, talks with me, tell me I am his own. The joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. That's why God has brought you and me into the kingdom for such a time as this. God needs somebody who can weather the storm. God needs somebody who can smile when you feel like crying. God needs somebody who can lift your hands and say hallelujah anyhow. Oh Lord, don't let your troubles get you down. Don't let your problems get you down. Hallelujah. Anyhow, say yes. Say yes. Come on, help me give God some praise. Thank you, Lord. Jesus was steadfast. Jesus was unmovable. He had experience in being a rock for 
the Bible says when Israel was marching from Egypt toward the land of promise every now and then there were no rivers no lakes no streams no rain but they did drink from the rock that followed them that rock was Christ that's why the song says she is a rock in a weary land shelter in the time of storm he's my rock my shield my fortress she is will show up when things go wrong she is will show up when your heart is heavy she is will show up when the lightning is flashing when the sun is roaring she is will show up and show out say yes say yes Somebody help me say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Show up when I'm all alone. Show up. Tears in my eyes. Show up when I'm weak. Because if you show up when I'm weak, then I can say when I'm weak, then am I strong? It ain't about me no how. It's about Jesus. Jesus is my strength. Jesus is my hope. Jesus is my friend. Jesus is my anchor. Jesus is my keeper. Jesus is my hope. All I need is in Jesus. Come on and lift your hand and tell him thank you, Jesus. Come on, lift those hands, raise your antennas and tell him thank you, Jesus. Thank you for keeping me. Thank you for holding me. Thank you for rocking me when I get weary. Thank you for feeding me when I get hungry. Thank you for giving me strength. Thank you for putting your arms all around me. Thank you for keeping me. Say yes. Say yes. Come on, help me give him some praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Everybody stand. Everybody stand. Come on and tell him thank you. Lift those hands and tell him thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You see, you can't testify until and unless you've been tested. To be tested means you gotta go through the fire. To be tested means God gotta let you get hit even though no weapon formed against you shall prosper. You may get hit, but he won't let it take you out. You may get hurt, but he won't let it destroy you. You may get knocked down, but God will pick you back up. Look at somebody and tell him he picked me up. He turned me around. He set my feet on solid ground. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, heaven, give him some praise. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Woo. Hallelujah! Now, I know, I know everybody.
everybody haven't been through that. I know everybody doesn't have that testimony. I know everybody doesn't have that experience. And so I'm not asking everybody to come, but I need, I need, I need about 20 people that's been through something. I need about 20 people that got hurt. I need about 20 people. The enemy slammed you, tried to knock you out. I need about 20 people that God brought you back from this. I need about 20 I said, I need about 20 people that's not ashamed to praise them. I need about 20 people. Who don't mind your makeup running. Don't mind your hair. But I need about 20 people that want to just give God some praise. I just want to praise it. I just want to thank you. I just want to bless you. I just want to lift you up. I just want to glorify you. Hallelujah. 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 Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let, let me walk with you. Let me walk. Let's go to the place. Well, somebody looked you in your eyes and said, you ain't nothing. You ain't going to be nothing. You'll never amount to nothing. Thank you, liar. Look at me now. By the grace of God, I am still standing, still praying, still serving, still smiling, still shouting thank you thank you thank you if I never if I never had a problem if I never had a liar if I never had a hater if I never had a backstabber I wouldn't know what God's grace can do for you thank you for mercy thank you for grace thank you for joy somebody help me say joy 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 Wait a minute. Look at somebody and tell them, give me a little room. Give me a little room. Tell them I'm getting ready to have a fit for G. Give me a little room. Give me a little room. My cup is running off. Give me a little room. I feel his glory. I feel his spirit. I feel his anointing. I feel a breakthrough. I feel a miracle. I feel healing in my belly. I feel glory. Give me a little room. Give me a little room. Leap for joy. Come on, leap. 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 Leap for joy. Give me a little room. I've been through too much not to praise him. Been through too much not to thank him. Been through too much not to worship him. My worship is for real. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, give it to him. Give it to him. Give it to him. This is Bishop J. Lewis Felton thanking you for joining us for the Mount Airy Kingdom Worship Experience. May you continue to partner with us as we share the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world. We love you in Jesus' name.